Good morning. All right, guys. So my name is Kimitha. Um, however, my nickname is Kim, and I will be one of the presenters today. And this is Ms. Donna. If you would like to introduce yourself, Ms. Donna. Mm -hmm. Miss Kim is the beautiful version of my younger self. <laughs> my name is uh, Donna Vinson, and I am a licensed uh, social worker with over <clears throat> years in the school system. I don't like, longer like to say how long it's been. Right. How about that? That's a coping skill. Yes. <laughs> Good morning and welcome, everyone. Awesome. Um, I guess I can give you guys a little background of myself as well. So I am a social worker. I am limited license. I'm working on my full license right now. Yay. Um, I actually have experience working with individuals on the spectrum as well as individuals in the juvenile detention facility. Um, in addition to that, I have lived abroad. So while a lot of what I tell you, I do have some statistics um, that would be relevant to our presentation. I do have a lot of um, personal experiences that I will be providing for you guys today. Um, so yeah, uh, let's get started. All right. All right, so basically a couple of things that we'll be talking about. Um, our introduction will go over um, undiagnosed individuals and misdiagnosed, right? That's pretty, that's a vast difference. And so a lot of uh, the families that we work with have children who are undiagnosed and they receive diagnoses that are maybe comorbid with autism or ADHD, but not necessarily what they have. And in addition to misdiagnosed, usually receiving an incorrect diagnosis based off of what they, the clinician assumes that the child has based on the behavior that they're displaying at the time. Um, the causes and effects of being misdiagnosed, we'll go over that what we can do to increase awareness and to decrease the gap. So basically giving you guys information, things to ask the clinician, how you can advocate for yourself, questions that you can ask. And I don't know if we have providers in here, but things that you can do also to help the families as well and also educating yourself. And then at the end, we'll do a wrap up questions, um, you know, things that maybe we didn't go over or you can introduce yourself and tell us about yourself. All right, so in my, my field, I have seen, I have saw a lot of um, kiddos, or even adults, not given the proper diagnosis, right? And so this can look like not, not receiving an autism diagnosis, anxiety, um, depression, uh, PTSD, or trauma, right? Things that they should have been diagnosed with but it goes unnoticed, right? It kind of slips through the cracks and we'll go over why. And then for the misdiagnosed, I see a lot of children, unfortunately, being diagnosed with operational defiance disorder. One disorder that we don't have up there is conduct disorder. I see that a lot too, they're bad, right? You guys hear that often. They're bad, they don't listen. Um, they act just like they daddy, things like that, right? Um, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and trauma, not taking into account the traumatic experience that some of these children actually go through. We don't know what they're going through when they're at home. Uh, we don't know what they're going through in their communities. And then developmental disabilities, okay? This is a really interesting one right here. And I say that because I see this a lot in my practice, especially working with you know, individuals from different cultures. I've worked with many people, people from Asia, people from uh, Ecuador. I've also worked with a family from Taiwan. Um, and I'm also working with a lot of our Spanish speaking families at the Autism Alliance because I am a navigator specialist. A lot of stigma comes from culture. And me being an African-American woman, I see that a lot in my family, right? Just now we're actually being okay with going to therapy. For a while, therapy was not acceptable um, in my family. It wasn't really acceptable uh, at all in a lot of African-American homes, right? You don't tell your business to other people. No, what, what happens in this family stays as a family. Okay, no, we're not talking about that, right? Um, we don't want to be judged, right? Telling our information to others and not wanting to be judged. Additionally, when we go over masculinity and femininity, what that looks like, and just to give an example, when I was working with my family from Taiwan, um, I would do therapy with a lot of the younger men and their families would say, you know, men, they don't deal with depression. They have to be strong for this family. 
We don't have time for that. We also see that in African-American families as well, right? We don't have time to be sad. You gotta keep going. Or I don't have time to cry tears. I got a family to take care of, right? Or for black men, that it's not appropriate to cry. It's not appropriate to be sad. Like, what are you sad for? Grow up, you know, toughen up, things like that. And that's what um, a lot of African-American families and also families from Asia that I have worked with would tell their younger boys or the young men how to not display their emotions, which is definitely detrimental and can also be very, um, very just, I can't think of the word because I'm having a brain block, but you guys get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, systemic distrust. I know we all have heard about what that looks like. Even now, not trusting the system. Um, working with a lot of Latino families at the Autism Alliance, I have a lot of parents who don't have citizenship. Um, and they're really concerned with uh, trusting the system to help them because they're afraid that no, I don't want to get in trouble. They're, you know, they'll, they'll send me back, or um, I don't want to, you know, talk about my situation type of thing. And I have had those conversations with a lot of families who are not citizens here, but do not trust the system, even though they are struggling. Can you imagine how disheartening that is? That they're too afraid to even ask for help. You know, that they're too afraid because they, I, well, I don't trust, I don't trust God. Like, you know, I don't know if you guys want to take away my kids, things like that. Additionally, African Americans with the medical system, we have had, we had a long history of <clears throat> systemic distrust as well. Um, and we'll kind of go over like the Tuskegee experiment, right? The Henrietta um, situation, right? And what that looks like for African Americans now, that still, <laughs> that historical piece still plays a very, very important role in our lives today. With the medical system. I, my best friend recently, she was in a situation, her it was a cyst wrapped around her ovaries and she was in excruciating pain and they minimized her pain and told her it doesn't hurt that bad. And her ovary was about to rupture. So she had to get it removed. But just situations like that, I had to help her advocate. They're not listening to me. They don't believe I'm in pain. That was just in 2021. That's not, that's last year. And we're still dealing with situations like that. Access to appropriate mental health services. This is a really big one. Um, we'll kind of go more in depth on what that looks like as well, but not having transportation to get to these mental health services, right? Or the access that they do have, they, they receive um, such unprofessionalism or people who do not care about the services that they receive, people who are not um, inclined to answer or get to know them or understand what they need um, because of the areas that they live in and also the stereotypes that are applied to them as well. Cultural barriers. This is also a really big deal. Religion. So I grew up in a Christian home and we really talk about praying and believing in God, right? And, oh, you don't, you don't need to go to therapy. Just talk to God. Just pray. Well, I can pray and go to therapy too, right? <laughs> right? I can, I can actually use both. And so a lot of times we'll use that religious card to say, you don't really need to go get help. It's okay. Just go ahead and you know, get on your knees and pray and all of it will just disappear. Well, that's not, you know, it's not It's okay though. Um, we already kind of went over masculinity and femininity. Uh, they do not want to have their children labeled. So as a navigator specialist, I also encounter this a lot. I'll have families who call and they'll say they received an autism diagnosis, right? But they're like, no, I want to get my child evaluated again. I don't think, I don't think they have autism, which is okay. I am all for um, advocating for a second evaluation if that's what you want, or you felt like maybe the clinician was not attentive enough. Um, but however, I had a family specifically tell me, I don't want my child to have autism. Is there something we can do to their brain? <laughs> to reverse this, to make this go away. Now, this was a family from India. And this is what I mean about cultural barriers and what that looks like. And for people of color, how, um, how strong their feelings are when it comes to having a child with autism. And when I heard him say that, I was kind of heartbroken about it because if this child, you know, this child does have autism, 
Um, I was sad to hear him say, I don't want this. I want to take him to a brain doctor and I want to get his brain adjusted. Um, and so a lot of this conversation, revol- it was like an hour conversation. We really just talked about what autism looks like, how you can be a supportive parent. It's okay. It's okay. And you're not alone. And I try to emphasize that as much as I can, because it's important for people to understand that you're not by yourself. And it's okay if your child is on the spectrum and what this will look like for you going forward. Um, cultural beliefs and language barrier. Language barriers is also a tough one. And I want to bring this up. I had a young lady who was from Taiwan and didn't speak English properly, but they labeled her and said she had a developmental disability. Instead of to say, maybe she needs tutoring with learning the language. But no, we're just going to ignore that. We'll just put her in a um, a resource room. And I understood that she had a, a language barrier because her family um, spoke, I think it was Chinese. It was a language from Taiwan. None of her family spoke English. So imagine growing up in a household, no one speaks English. You go to school, you're trying to communicate, and you're like, I don't even know the language. I know what I'm trying to say, but I can't even communicate to you what I'm trying to say, right? And so that's also what I mean by paying attention to the barrier, paying attention to what's happening, what is going on, how can I assist you? Let me understand you better to, you know, really give you the resources and services that you need. All right, are you guys keeping up here? I feel like I'm talking a lot. You're good? Awesome. Okay. Um, systemic medical disparities. And so this is the Tuskegee, um, Tuskegee experiment here. Yeah, Ms. Donna, you can go over this a little bit more because you know a lot more about it than I do. And then the lack of trust in the medical community will kind of go hand in hand with the top bulletin. And navigating will be me and implicit bias. Go ahead, Ms. Donna. I want to go back to the previous language, slide. Okay. previous slide. Yes, ma'am. Um, Sometimes we have to do uh, a little bit more digging. And as a school social worker, I've had to go back to the emergency card. The kid speaks two languages, the parents do not. Who else on the emergency card can I get to come in that the family trusts Mm -hmm. to have this meeting with an interpreter? And I've had the kid run the show until mama brings the dentist. Who's on the emergency card? You know, nobody. Oh, no, no, no. To do a little further uh, footwork to go and get up uh, to, if, if, if like, we have the right to call your, um, your school system and say, who are the interpreters here? Because what can come back on you when the parents feel empowered is you had this meeting and you didn't ask. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you're in this. <laughs> I call it a hell of a. How did I? How did we get here? Because mm-hmm. nobody at the table knew to ask for more help. Who else? So I've gone as far as you using that emergency card. Somebody else that we trust in the system. Can you please come in for this meeting? And those meetings have been at Walmart. <laughs> those meetings have been at Meyer. Mm-hmm. Those meetings were not during school times where I could get the information, I need your signature to move us forward. Nothing is impossible if you're going to ask. The, um, there is for uh, counselors, I haven't seen it for social workers. There's a textbook out there and it goes way back. It's like a cookbook of every culture what, what to do and what not to do. Do not ever call the dad. Do call the mom. And there are cultures where you call the mom first or you make sure you talk to dad first. Mm-hmm. And it was very, very helpful. However, I was the only one in the team interested in going to that level. Go the extra mile. That's how we are developing trust and respect from the parents. Yes. Also, a lot of times we find cultural beliefs and language barriers. Sometimes the kids are very, very active. Those are the ones I, I want to take that extra mile in. What can, can we get them into sports? And <laughs> most, most sports programs in, the, in, in public schools have said, no, but he's good. 
well, he just wants to knock the lights out when everybody else wants to shoot a basket. <laughs> he needs a different kind of coach, which means we go into a game together to show you how not to go to jail. We're going for the basket, and it takes a lot of coaching. In that arena, though, that parent sees other parents do with such like children, and how do we start to develop a coalition with them? Now, you have the most powerful rich parents who know the law, and they will bring an attorney to your IEPC meeting. You were just having a little IEPC meeting. <laughs> Next thing you know, oh, we have the advocate over here, and here's the attorney, and you're in a world of trouble, you don't know how to get here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you didn't ask like four questions before you even call this meeting, and here we are. So there are a lot of steps that <laughs> I, I am amazed that are still not taught in school. Mm -hmm. You get dumped into the social work pool, the support pool, and you don't start speaking up and bringing all the resources till we're in trouble. And we're trying not to do that right. way before we get way before we get there to advocate for the kid. A lot of people won't say, listen, I need you to be successful in spite of your behavior. I was in a building with 1,600 kids. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes, the bell rings. It's total quiet in the building. Why is there one out of 1,600 kids walking around the building? Can't sit down. Okay. What does this mean? Look around. There's some supports that are needed for this kid up front that we haven't put in place yet. I get a lot of backlash from teachers who want to diagnose the kid <laughs> without putting in behavior supports in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Go to the office is the favorite word. You can't mm -hmm. sit down. Go get discipline way before I ask how to engage you. What's happening? Do you have a counselor? Do you have a social worker? Do you have an auntie that we could even talk to way before we get to the discipline issues in school? Yeah. Lack of trust in the medical community. Um, a lot of times a kid would have been already diagnosed and just like you said, nope, I don't want that label. Yes, in Michigan, you can get the whole battery of tests. The team has said, this is where you are. The parents say, no, we're not going to accept it. You know how they have that? I, I think it's still seven days. This is the report. Come back and tell us whether you want services or not. And the parent says, no. We're not, we're not, we're not going to make any decisions about what these recommendations you have on the paper, deal with it. We have to deal with them at home. We are not ready yet to go that step. A lot of times these kids wind up medical report after medical report, accident, something happened on the weekend, they're getting medical treatment, they're coming in with, um, they hit their tongue, they broke their finger, just little things starting. And nobody unravels. <laughs> there's a history of Islam. And nobody, so the school is not talking to the hospital. The hospital is not talking to the, to the school because we shouldn't be talking without a permission slip. And we're, we're, we're stuck right there until when somebody crosses the line and says, hey, did you ask, do you know a nurse over at the hospital where we could get further information? Is there a social, medical social worker in the hospital that we could talk to? So it's, it's going, yeah, we, and a lot of times barriers are broken down with says, hey, I don't trust you, you don't trust me. Let's trust each other for this kid. And then navigating the academic environment and the me helping families figuring out where to go. Have you ever been in a situation or just anything like you're, I don't even know where to start. Where, what am I supposed to be doing again? Or who am I supposed to be calling? Or you don't call like 20 people and you're like, I don't even know if I called you. <laughs> I might've called you already. So helping families to navigate the mental health system, um, finding resources, right? Particularly with children who need evaluation or adults who are on the spectrum as well. But navigating and access to medical health services is very difficult because 
um, there is just a lot. It's a lot of information. It's a lot to know. It's a lot to learn. Um, and so a lot of times people do not want to start. It's too daunting. It's too overwhelming. Um, I'm okay. I'll do it next week. And then next week turns into months. And then you never get to it, right? Um, and I definitely understand how it can be overwhelming because um, I do it every day. So I get it. <laughs> I get looking for those resources, how it can just be a never ending, uh, sometimes a dead end and also just a never ending cycle. Like, okay, um, am I getting somewhere? It doesn't feel like it, but you are just by starting, right? Just actually making the phone call. Right. Um, and eventually I had a lot of families who have made five phone calls and they finally get to us. And I'm like, well, well, well you have come to the right place. <laughs> but, but but how about when the parent knows more than the staff right? and they bring food to the meeting? You have been there four hours. You know you've been hijacked. <laughs> they, they know more than you. And you are uh, a yep. big doo-doo yep. and they called your supervisor into the meeting. I think that was horrible. That's a horrible day. <laughs> and then we have implicit bias. Um, I'm pretty sure, honestly, a lot of people probably do this. We all do it. Um, can y'all? Okay. No, I'm a little this is fancy. I never had a mic before. <laughs> trying to figure out how it works. <laughs> um, implicit bias, stereotyping, prejudging people. Um, this is something that also affects diagnosis because we're automatically assuming, we're assuming about this individual based on what we, what we think we know, right? Our social um, interactions, right? Or things we see on media that can also influence our judgment as well. And we see that a lot in the medical field also, and also with clinicians um, who are evaluating, you know, children or adults. Um, and we need to let go of that. We have to get rid of that because that can definitely give you a skewed opinion or even a false narrative and also an incorrect diagnosis when you're putting your biases and your assumptions in your evaluation. That is a huge, huge no-no. Um, and so what we really have to do is understand all of, you know, each other, understand each other, um, our historical perspectives, right, our cultural history, um, in addition to our social history, how we were raised, how we grew up, all of those things play a huge difference. Um, I was working with, I always have stories, y'all. I really have stories for days, sorry. But I was working at um, the public defenders. I was in the juvenile detention facility for my internship. I had a kid. He was diagnosed with operational defiance disorder, um, ADHD, and some other things. And he had such a traumatic experience. Um, I think he saw his uncle get killed. Um, and then he would walk home from school and he said he, you know, saw a dead body, things like that. And I would hear uh, the social worker and the public defenders just bypass it like it didn't matter. Oh, he did say he saw, you know, this walking home from school, but that still doesn't account for his behavior. And I'm sitting there in tears. Like, well, what do you mean? This, that's a traumatic experience. So why wouldn't it? you know, alter his behaviors or why wouldn't it change him in some, you know, some way. Um, and my social work, my field supervisor pulled me to the side and asked me why I was getting emotional about it. And I said, well, you have this brown kid, you know, and he's going through all of these things and you guys are just like, oh, ODD, operational defiance disorder, that's it. All right, we're going to put him on for like, what? We're not taking account into anything else, even though it's in the file. Um, and I just remember crying, seeing that, because a lot of times we do just, just throw out these diagnoses, because to them, it's another kid. And unfortunately, sometimes it's just getting through the cases, right? They have so many cases, so many clients. It's just getting, I just got to be through I just got to, you know. Um, and that was heartbreaking for me. I think that was like a, a pivotal moment in my social work career. Um, and it made me more eager to become a social worker because I wanted to be the social worker that actually took the time to truly work with these families and understand these families, even if they didn't look like me. So, yes. Lack of insurance. Shanti's actually supposed to go like, oh, what could we have? Our insurance question. <laughs> Shanta, do you want to go over this? Um, actually, you were supposed to, so <laughs> everyone give it up for Shanta. <laughs>
Yeah, she was really trying to leave me hanging, and I was not having that. So, do you want my mic? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. I want to get out of your room. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought they were just going to like, I thought I missed this part, actually. No. Um, <laughs> so basically, the insurance component and what a lot of families face is they don't understand what their insurance covers. So when you have the Medicaid insurance benefit, a lot of families don't know that you have to go through community mental health or that if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance, that you do have a mental health benefit that is attached to your Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance that allows you to get evaluations and other services that you need. Mm -hmm. So this was just, we do a whole nother insurance segment, not at this conference, but we have it online. And basically it kind of walks you through how you can access insurance in different areas and what that looks like. And also what it is to not know about these options. Like when you don't know, what your insurance um, can do. So that is it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, guys. I love Shanta so much because she is just a real of knowledge. Um, so anytime you guys call the Navigator line and you have insurance questions, guess who y'all going to be talking to? Shanta. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shanta, for your beautiful face and beautiful presentation. We just really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, so that was a good breakdown of just insurance. Also, too, um, when it comes to Medicaid, there are a lot of resources when it comes to Medicaid and additional uh, support coordinator, which is how you access a lot of the services through Medicaid as well. I learned that from Joanna, who's also here. Gosh, you guys are going to be really like less of us right now. All right, cause and effect of a misdiagnosis. So I am going to have Ms. Donna kind of go like the school-based services. Um, receiving inappropriate services, right? We kind of touched a little bit on that. Um, when you don't have the correct diagnosis, you will not receive the correct services. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you have a child who has autism, but they were diagnosed with maybe ADHD or anxiety, which is sometimes what can happen, they are not receiving ABA. So they won't get those ABA services. And that can actually go on for a long time, which can also affect their um, transition to adulthood. So a lot of the stuff that they could have learned in ABAs, but particularly like social skills, things like that, how to communicate emotions, how to um, handle their challenging behaviors, that kind of starts trickling into adulthood. And now they're like, well, I don't know what to do. Um, so we want to be really careful about um, just paying close attention to, um, you know, the evaluation, how the clinician evaluates, giving them as much information as possible. Um, on your child's like background and things like that. And truly just understanding that this can have an effect on them in the long term and kind of what that looks like for them. Um, okay, Ms. Donna, you can go over school-based services. Um, a big red flag in inappropriate services is way before uh, a student with, be um, with behavior issues, especially for the black and brown child, they get more police services, <laughs> office disciplinary services way before they get a good intervention and testing done. And I don't know if any of you being in the field, I used to say, have you, have you had somebody do an IEPC on you since you want to help so much? Do you know what it's like to have a social worker, a psychologist, a special ed teacher, a language teacher, put you at the forefront in a meeting, write up everything they found and go to over explain to the parent that nausea. What's wrong with you? And then you get to the back of the page and they explain, well, we are, we've been into this an hour and a half. Eyes roll back in the head. Just get to the bottom line. How are you going to help my kid? They develop this fine tuned, wonderful age that's called an IEPC advance. Have a, a, person, it must have been a person from heaven who developed that. Because that's not what happened in the meetings. When you are pounded with how wrong your, your kid is wired and how cause and effect and all the stuff you've done, and then you say, oh, yeah, yeah. 
we're going to get these three services. And see you later. See you in a year. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes back or empower the parents to say, you know what, those three things that you recommended up front, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. We only have one teacher following the plan. Mm -hmm. One. Talk about it. And so with that, I, I used to be the, 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 bad, the bad person in the room. Who's going to sabotage the plan? Now, are you going to sabotage the plan because you don't like the kid? The kid hijacks your program every day. You know who he is. He comes every day. Never stays home. You are the one. <laughs> you are the one with the bias. You are the one with the bias. They wait to give your classroom the show. And nothing has changed. And when the social worker comes back and says, may I see how you, you're rewarding and redirecting the person? Nah, no, no evidence. So you have the school bias, the inappropriate services, the stereotypes, he's never going to make it, she's never going to make it. Mm -hmm. And then the school to prison pipelines. However, we see that opening our eyes. If the police liaison, and, and, and forgive me, because I see I was more in middle and high school. Mm -hmm. What you doing in the office again? What you talking to the police liaison for again? This is how this starts. All the other while, the, the, the white or Hispanic or Indian kids, they have a sports team, they have a support system outside, they have, they're involved in church, and you haven't mentioned these particular things to the parents. And that's how we get there. And, 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 and I've had to develop all, after all these years. I don't want my kid to have this experience and I don't want your kid to have this experience either. Mm -hmm. Simple. And I really do need you to be successful so you don't have to rob me in the parking lot. How about that? I really am invested in you finishing using all the supports, getting a high school diploma, getting a job, so that you don't have to rob me because I come to work every day. I'm, I'm up for the fight. I am here every day. I want nothing less for you. Now, when you don't get the stuff I have to go through the walk, I'm your victim. We ain't having that. I want the same thing for you. I want to feel safe. I want you to feel safe. I am sorry somebody ripped you off. Have you had the experience of a, of a homeless kid coming into your building now? Off the bus from the homeless centers. I was so embarrassed one day. I was coming through Pontiac and the school bus was just stopped. And I'm going like, oh my God, I want to get home. Why is this bus stopped up in front of me? And I hadn't yet connected every kid coming off that bus was going into the shelter. And that's how disconnected some of us are. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're the social, do you have a closed closet? If they kind of smelly when they come to school, do you know they can do it, do laundry? Do you know they might need to do laundry in your building and carry an extra set of clothes so they don't have that smell because they've been living out of a garbage bag? That level of support and care and eyes wide open. I've had the privilege of working with principals that says we have a closed closet, and on your lunch break, would you run up to the Kmart and get some underwear? Clean socks, clean shoes, just like everybody else. Take the family <laughs> over and stop sitting ringing. If it was your family, what would you do? Okay, that's your family now. Understand, in this building might be the only sense of family they have. So it's on you. Okay, beautiful. I kind of just wanted to piggyback on that. This is a this is a, a, a real thing that's still happening. My mother is a teacher. And to hear you talk about um, the situations that occurred in, in your school building with the middle school and high school kids, my mom works with elementary kids. And she has a little girl who goes home during lunch to give her grandmother her diabetes medication while also taking care of her two siblings. This is a real thing for some of these children. 
In addition to that, she has another young boy who's in her class who she clearly continues to advocate for him and says, he needs services. I believe he's on the spectrum. He needs help. And sometimes it's like talking to a brick wall because some people really just show up to work, right? They just show up. I'm just coming for a paycheck. And that's a sad reality for some of the families that we work with. However, when we have individuals like Ms. Donna and my mother who are like, no, this is unacceptable. Who's following the behavior plan? Who is actually advocating for these services? Does the parents know about what they have a right to? Does the parents know about faith? Do they know about, you know, a free appropriate public education, right? So like these things are very important to just know that it's still happening. It's 2020, it's still happening. Um, and it's it's real, it's a real thing. So um, I get I get to laugh at my teachers. They think the only time to call a social worker is when we smell something. Come on. Right. Okay, that, that might be a hint that somebody going to the Kmart during their lunch hour, <laughs> getting a clean t-shirt, some, some clean underwear, helping them get a shower down in the gym. Mm -hmm. um, for, for autistic children, I learned very painfully how we had set up a whole system to make them feel good in school because the kid would not bathe and did not take into account the sensory issues with the shower and the water and the skin. That's a whole nother issue. And we went to battle because her mom was in the building and we were pulling out on all these supports and the kid was miserable. We suffered together and with no, you, you had to wash everything but the hair. <laughs> wash everything else. And so those are the levels we went to for her to have a somewhat normal day. That's beyond care. And some people, that's not in my job description. Yes, it will be because Everybody's going to say, but we have a social worker in the building, but we have a counselor in the building, and they're not. Have you heard that? And they're not. They're not what? I need a team to pull this off. I'm not going to uh, approach anybody's kid without another helper. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, so the adverse effect of an adult misdiagnosis. I mean, pretty much it kind of just prolongs. If a child is misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, it prolongs and goes into their adulthood, right? And we, I see this a lot um, as a navigator. A lot of adults are figuring things out and they're saying, it's something, it's a disconnect here. I feel like something else is going on. I'm not really sure what it is. Now, what makes it more difficult for adults is that there aren't a lot of places that complete adult evaluation, autism evaluations. And so now we run into the issue of finding somewhere for them to go. Okay, what kind of insurance do you have? Okay, do you have a support coordinator? Okay, well, these three places do adult, adult autism evaluations. However, you're all the way in Grand Rapids and they're all the way in Oakland or Wayne County. So you may have to travel. Well, I don't have transportation, right? You see where the, the issue kind of just, it kind of is a domino effect. And now we have an adult who is possibly on the spectrum has not had ADA services or anything like that, just trying to figure life out right now at the age of 23, 24. In jail. A lot of people get their mm -hmm. first diagnosis in jail. Yep. Now, I've been blessed enough to see people on the opposite side of this. Mm -hmm. uh, how about this scenario? Very bright kid on the spectrum. Mama says no to testing because they're just white and different. <laughs> okay. And instead of getting an evaluation and getting more support to be even better, just yep. move them up. Yep. Yep. This adult now is now 27. She can come into this room. You will never guess just by her looks. She can speak, but she cannot persevere with any task, which means she can get a job. She can do an interview but she will not persevere to finish it. Two weeks in, two weeks in, she moves all the office furniture to the way she wants it to be. So now mama is coming home from school and watching 27 year old, no services, mm -hmm. standing on the corner. No diagnosis. Looking, no diagnosis, looking out in space. Mm -hmm. and when she tells me that my heart just lost sex trafficking. <laughs> Ooh, what a, she's just in the victim mode. Mama right. doesn't have any, any supports, daughter doesn't have any supports, but you cannot, that, that whole 
uh, spectrum you cannot tell by looking initially. And that's the bag they're in. And it's very, very sad and very sad to unroll. You're 27. Unfortunately, the quickest place you can get, get, get an evaluation, a real evaluation is in jail. Yeah, I actually have a family like that right now. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. And also the inability to foster healthy relationships. And when you brought up the trafficking, <clears throat> a lot of times that's usually what it is, the inability to like assess what a healthy relationship is, you know, not able to assess what toxic behaviors are, mm -hmm. right? Um, not being able to manage money, giving money away, or if they do have a job, not, you know, being able to pay bills, things like that, or giving money to their friends, right? We see that a lot as well. So, all right, guys, I promise we're almost there, but I'm enjoying you guys. All right, so things you can do um, as a parent or a provider, be more knowledgeable. I cannot stress this enough. Learn about the community you're working. Learn about yourself. Learn about your child, what that looks like. Learn about their diagnosis, what that'll look like, how it's showing up for them. Um, if you're a provider, learning about their culture, right? Really understanding the community that they come from. What, what does that look like for them? Ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be, I mean, you can be inquisitive, but don't be rude. So, I mean, we can distinguish that. So ask questions. Be okay with asking questions. Like, I encourage you to uh, just interact with the people that you work with. Excuse me, one other thing. Yes, ma'am. Speak to parents that you perceive are being successful navigating their kids. Mm -hmm. There's something into saying, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's do dinner. I've got a new parent in the system. Can you give them some pointers? They love, most of them love to share. This yeah. is what I know. Mm -hmm. This is where we can go together. Because the isolation is real. I have this one child, I'm in the situation all by myself, no help is coming, nothing's changed. Um, but I found a group of wonderful parents. These, these wonderful parents, they have means. They have already figured out uh, the supports they need in school. Uh, even the children have gone on to university. They knew how to ask for help when they got there. The universities know what they have and they say, no, there's no help. Yes, it can be done. I've walked through. I go on the college tours. I've gone and helped them fill out the applications at my I have gone and I've, and I've let parents show me what this is like. Um, and it's through parents I've learned even more supports than I had in my own tool bag. But that's having an alliance with your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was a good, really good point. Um, so that I think that kind of really goes in with being active, like in your community, mm -hmm. building an alliance with your. But community. and the other part of that, though, I'm a stranger in their community, but this I was still welcome and invited to learn. Yeah. But educating the friends and family just because they might have a good support system in school doesn't mean that the family buys <laughs> the diagnosis. And there's some of them you really should not share anything at all. Just, just don't even bother. The, uh, a, a prime example, mom had a drug problem. When the kid is taking medication that she's allowed, the kid is finishing work, completing assignments, being active. And I'm not saying this to promote all medications, but working with a good psychiatrist, good psychologist, who's using the same. She is kicking my door. The, I'm a sonatic. I don't want him to have any medication. There goes our conflict for the next four years. Right. Okay? So what, no matter what we put in, is a sabotage of the world because of her beliefs and the family beliefs. No, 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 no. Okay. And, and, and literally, that's our healthy boundary. Okay. I'm not ending my career on the 7 o'clock news social worker <laughs> was recommending blah, blah, blah. Just write down on the paper. These were the things. This is how this went. Back up. Yep, exactly. Um, and one thing I do want to mention too, with, I mean, as far as them being supportive of the school and professionals with follow through, call your school. And also document, document, document. That's what Heather told me. Hey, Heather. <laughs> Everything should be in documentation. You want to have a paper trail. If you're requesting an IEP, email them. Write it in documentation, all of that good stuff. 
Um, so you have the information that you need, push come to shove, if you need an education advocate, or this is what I sent, this is what I said, this is what I requested, these were my concerns, right? Um, and follow through, call that school, I call them. Go up there. Go, get the, go, up, go up to that school if you need to. Go up there, go to the, the front desk, whatever you have to do, do not be scared, just do it. Appropriately, yeah. don't get arrested. Don't go, and yeah, no, I don't want you to get arrested. I would never hurt you. Like, excuse me. Um, yeah, no, what y'all do that? <laughs> but I know on the inside you might feel that way. So I totally, I totally understand. But absolutely, follow through with the professionals. Um, all right, providers. We kind of already went over this in the previous, but be aware of your biases your prejudices, your stereotypes, we all have them. Um, there's no perfect person in this room. Be aware of that, how you feel about the culture that you're working with or the community that you're working with and what that looks like for you. How is that going to affect your evaluation? How is this gonna affect my interaction with this family, right? Um, uh, also be willing to partner it. when you know you have a bias. Yes. Look here, send her. <laughs> Let her go. I know what my bias is. It's not going to work. Yeah. Okay. Be real. Please, please go up front. Yeah. Meet the family. I'll, 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 I'll back up. You need a team process here. Go. You yeah. can speak nicely. You know, Mama went out for me the last time, and I haven't recovered yet. I'm still in therapy from that. Be real with your <laughs> I, 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 Go. Take the lead in the meeting. You hush. Yeah, be real with yourself. We have to have that kind of uh, support for one another. It's about. Yeah, for sure. Come on. We gotta <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> I have a bias. It did not go well last time. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, providers, be willing to answer questions in an honest way, in a professional way. Tell the truth. What are your actual thoughts? Um, it's okay. Just be honest. Be upfront. And allow time for the families to ask questions. I cannot stress this enough. I've had a lot of families who say, well, they just, it seemed like they just wanted me in and out. Or it seemed like they just wanted to be done with me. Like I was taking up their time. I said, they're, they're there to do their jobs. And if they need to ask them 30 questions or however many questions, or if you got a schedule for follow-up time, however, you should be able to ask questions to your provider, okay? And providers, please allow time for individuals to do that. I don't care how small you think the question is, if it's a little repetitive, it's okay. You have to understand what vulnerable state these families are in in that moment. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, you have to understand what vulnerable state these families are in at that moment, how anxious they probably are. So just be graceful and just allow them to, allow them the opportunity to ask questions. I don't know what that is. Oh, yes, we are. Additional questions. resources. Huh? I was saying, anybody has any questions? Oh, wait, let me go over these resources. Okay. It's kind of hard. Sorry. Quality time, girl. <laughs> um, additional resources that I myself use as a navigator. Michigan Alliance for Families is actually a parent mentor group. Right, Heather? All right, so these are parents who um, really know how to navigate like the school system. If you have questions or need like a support system and navigating the educational system, that is where you want to go. Um, we have Disability Rights of Michigan. The ARC offers a lot of resources. I would just encourage you to kind of go on their website, scroll through a little bit. They have um, ARC for different counties. So you would just go there, find your county, and go through there. Psychology Today um, is where you can, of course, find therapists. And then Therapy for Black Girls is a really good one if you prefer an African-American therapist and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And of course, the Autism Alliance of Michigan, that's us. If you need a navigator, feel free to contact us and we are always going to help you guys. If you have any Spanish-speaking families, I do speak Spanish and therefore I can't help Spanish-speaking families if they are in need of assistance. Okay. Okay. Um, how about when you see brown and black kids don't really have autism? Yeah, how about only white kids? Yeah. Just say. It. Actually, yeah. And I, you know what? I was just reading an article about this. African American kids are like sixty percent less likely to be that, and then Hispanic kids are at fifty. That is a very sick. That is a high number. It's a high, and that and that's ridiculous. We really have yeah, conduct disorder. Yeah, that's what I said. Conduct disorder or ODD. <laughs> 
There are other defined yeah. operational defined as well. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Any more questions? Any more comments? I really love talking to y'all. So y'all have to listen to me. Thank you.